Lovely, thanks Lauren. Um, so yeah, my name is Dr Rebecca Cannon, so I'm a Community Section and Reproductive Health Registrar. I'm currently working with the Public Health Team at Birmingham City Council and I'm going to present the toolkit around risk reduction for HIV, Hepatitis B and Hepatitis C as part of the Birmingham Measurement Tools webinar series. So what's this for? So we know that when we use any intervention, um, it needs to be assessed as to its impact and its outcome, because this helps us demonstrate that an intervention is making a difference and a measurement tool allows us to do this. And using a standardised tool means that we can also compare different interventions against each other, assess their impact, look at their effectiveness in different groups and look at their cost effectiveness as well. Without measurement, then we're unable to say whether an intervention is helping or making a difference. So the Birmingham Public Health Measurement Toolbox has been developed to standardise um, measurements for health and wellbeing interventions in Birmingham. And the intention of this is to support different organisations when they're providing interventions or applying for funding. Um, so if different organisations are using the same tool, they can be easily compared and um, evaluated with regards to their effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Um, so over the course of this week, Lauren and her team are presenting a series of webinars about different areas of health and well-being. We're not going to talk about all of this today, but we're going to talk about HIV and hepatitis risk reduction. So hopefully these presentations will explain what the tools are, how to use them and give some more background information and helpful resources. So. Just to start off, we're going to talk about what are HIV and hepatitis. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and it's a virus um, that once acquired damages your immune system and impacts your body's ability to fight disease and infection. HIV is really preventable. Things have moved on really quickly in the past few decades, and we've got amazing advances in healthcare that means that there's medication you can take to stop you from getting HIV if you don't already have it. And also medication that people living with HIV can take that means that they're unable to pass it on to anyone else. And we know that people living with HIV can live long and healthy lives um, without having ever passed the virus on to anyone else. Hepatitis B and C are um, viruses as well that can cause damage to your liver. And for the hepatitis, so there's really good ways that we can reduce the risk of um, acquiring the viruses. So there's vaccinations to protect us against hepatitis B. There's risk reduction behaviours that we know people can do to um, prevent them from acquiring the viruses. And there's also medications that if we test people and find that they've got the viruses early on, obviously we can prevent onward transmission and we can also help them um, to reduce the impact that the virus has on their bodies. And both of these infections can have completely no symptoms for a long time or can have symptoms that mimic kind of like a flu or a rash or something like that. So it's really important to test because we can't always know or uh, someone might not realise that they've acquired one of these viruses. HIV and hepatitis B and C can be spread by sharing needles or injecting equipment, um, by sex without a condom, and by what we call maternal transmission, so from mum to baby during pregnancy, childbirth or breastfeeding. So for a little bit of context, there are approximately 95,000 people living with HIV in the UK, and just over 2,000 of these live in Birmingham. We also know, looking from recent data, that there were just under 300 new diagnoses of HIV in the West Midlands last year alone, and 19 of these were late stage. And we know that this is a prevent preventable virus, um, so really this shouldn't be happening, and there's things that we can do to try and help with this. There's also a disproportionate rise in new diagnoses amongst women exposed through sex with men. So there were 111 um, new diagnoses amongst women in the West Midlands last year alone. And this is increasing. So it was a stable level of 70 in 2021 and 2022. So 
Moving back to hepatitis, so there are 200,000 people living with hepatitis B and 81,000 people living with hepatitis C in the UK. And in 2022 alone, there were just over 200 new diagnoses of hep B and 139 new diagnoses of hep C. So we know that transmission in the community is still happening. And this is all really important because in October of 2022, Birmingham signed up to a global initiative called Fast Track Cities Plus, which which aims to eliminate transmission of HIV, viral hepatitis and TB by 2030. So we've clearly got a lot of work to do. So HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C can all be diagnosed by a blood test. And as I said earlier, early diagnosis means that we can um, reduce transmission, we can provide access to treatment and we'll get better he health outcomes for those living with the viruses. The other thing is that if we identify those who test negative, we have the opportunity to provide vaccination against hepatitis B, um, PrEP, which is medication that people who are at high risk of HIV can take that prevents them from um, acquiring the virus. And also we can discuss um, behaviour change measures to reduce risk of um, acquiring the virus in the future as well. So what are we aiming to measure in this tool? So because there's that disproportionate rise in women, we initially were targeting this tool at women, but this tool can be used to anyone who we think is at high risk of BBV, which means bloodborne viruses, which is a bit easier for me to say than HIV and hepatitis. And so we want to increase the number of people who understand their risk, who are vaccinated for hep B if appropriate, who are using PrEP if eligible, and who are engaging in risk reduction behaviours. And then we want to measure the impact of any interventions that are targeting that, targeting that to see how effective they are. So this tool is intended to be used to identify those who are at high risk through a series of questions, see what their background knowledge and understanding is, because as we know, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of people may not feel that they're at high risk. I, once we know, um, once we identify people who are at high risk, we want to check that they want to make a change and that they feel ready to make a change. Because as we know, with all sort of behaviour change strategies, if someone doesn't feel ready to make a change, then, you know, outcome is unlikely to really have any change or make any progress. And then we want to obviously um, see these people after the intervention has been made to see if there's been any change. So this is kind of a basic flowchart of the tool and then I'll go into sort of all the areas in a bit more detail. So the first part would be a risk assessment. So that's identifying people who we think are at higher risk of acquiring these viruses. Um, number two is a knowledge and behaviour assessment. So what do they know about the viruses? What do they think about their own behaviour and their own risk? And then communicating that risk back to them. So risk identifying identification so if we think someone's high risk explaining it to that uh, explaining that to them and then number four seeing how they feel about that see if they want to make a change and see if they feel ready to make a change and then an action plan so what are the steps forward what steps can we take to try and reduce that risk and then obviously follow up and then reassessing where we are and if any further changes need to be made so obviously this tool needs to be used following consent from participants so you know you could just say you know we've got a tool that wants to discuss the risk of bloodborne viruses do you know what that is are you happy to have a chat about HIV and hepatitis you know just really open up front questions and obviously it shouldn't be affecting the service that that person is um, using and obviously if they don't want to engage that's always fine they can always take written information or it can be discussed at another time there's a lot of stigma around these um, viruses and around the kind of behaviours that put you at high risk of acquiring these viruses so it's really important um, that any questions around um, that we're discussing in the tools today should be asked in a private setting so one-to-one -one, uh, with no one else present no fear of being overheard um, no fear of being pressured by others um, and obviously with interpreting or translating services used where needed and where appropriate. 
again because this can uncover quite some quite sensitive and personal information there should be discussions about confidentiality and any organization that uses this tool really should have processes and procedures in place about data storage and be able to explain confidentiality to their service users and the limits of confidentiality as well and be able to explain that data shouldn't be um, shared without consent and it should be stored in a, con a secure way where you've got control over who can access that data. So moving on to the tool itself. So the first part of the tool is risk assessment. So this is identifying behaviours that put people at an increased risk of BBVs. So the first one is about country of birth. So we know that being born outside of those areas um, is a higher risk um, for having already acquired the viruses. The other thing is um, about number of sexual partners. So if it's someone who has a high number of sexual partners, then they again might be at a higher risk of acquiring the viruses. Those who engage in commercial sex work, those who inject drugs or have sex with those who inject drugs. Um, men who are gay, bisexual or other men who have sex with men or people who are having sex with people from that community having sex with anyone born outside of um, those areas is listed there, using drugs prior to having sex. So we know, especially in the GBMSM community, um, chem sex, so using drugs to reduce inhibitions, um, to prolong sex, um, can be quite popular and quite commonplace, but obviously can lead to riskier sex. So it's important to have discussions about that. Have they ever um, been diagnosed with an STI in the past? Um, and obviously, have they ever had sex with someone who they know have one of these viruses? So quite sensitive questions, um, but quite straightforward, open questions um, that can really help to highlight those who are at high risk. So the next step is the behaviour and knowledge test. So what are their personal beliefs? So are they worried about acquiring these viruses? What do they know about these viruses? Do they know how they can acquire them? Do they know what they can do to prevent themselves from acquiring them? Which may kind of seem quite straightforward, but from you know working in sexual health services, it's still really commonplace for people to believe myths like, you know, if you're from a certain community, you're at no risk of acquiring HIV, regardless of who you have sex with, or there's no treatment for HIV um, and things like that. So it's really important to make sure you go back to basics and understand someone's baseline knowledge um, before you go on to have discussions. So do they feel high risk at acquiring the viruses? And would they like to know more about their risk and how to reduce this. And obviously, that's a really important question, because if they don't want to engage further, um, then there's no sort of coercion or pressure from the organisation. And then a knowledge test that these, again, are just some um, basic questions that can help us kind of understand where they're coming from. Um, so do they know the difference between HIV and AIDS? Do they know who can um, acquire HIV? Do they know about vaccination programmes or PrEP? Um, do they know about condom use um, and do they you know just dispelling all that stigma and having those open discussions as well so once you've kind of got that background information you should be able to have an idea as to whether this person is high risk um, so maybe if they've answered yes to any of the questions from two slides ago um, or, you know, do they feel ready to make a change and do they want to make a change? And that's kind of a key point in this tool. Sometimes, you know, you can just say, you know, I think you're at high risk of these viruses and it's not something that that person's ever considered before. And so that doesn't need to be taken further. You can give them the information and then you can always pick it up at a later date when they want to or feel ready to change. Or perhaps they do feel ready to make a change. And at that point, you can kind of go further. So things to consider, things you could discuss. So, you know, what is it about that current behaviour that's putting them at risk? What would be the ideal goal behaviour? And how do you achieve that goal? And that can be a collaborative plan um, with you and the service user. Do referrals need to be made? Can you put them in touch with CGL, with their local sexual health services? And when will you get back in touch with that person um, to see how things are? So kind of a really you know, basic example could be like, 
someone who's having um, lots of sex without a condom and you think perhaps they're at risk of viruses so you discuss using condoms in future you discuss the referral to a sexual health clinic for testing for consideration for prep you give them that information and then you see them in a few months time to see how things are and then obviously you want to follow them up and this is really where you can see whether that intervention has made a difference Obviously, we always want to celebrate any progress, but sometimes progress isn't made or things have perhaps gone away that you didn't expect. Um, and it's always good to be neutral about that and see, you know, if they still want to make a change, what extra support can we offer? Um, can we see them again? Um, so really, what is the outcome of that intervention of having that discussion with the person? So specific things to consider. So I think we've already touched on this a little bit. Um, we know that this can sometimes um, patient, uh, people can experience a lot of stigma when discussing these. It can be very sensitive information. And sometimes when we're talking about things like, you know, sexual partners, about um, drug use and sex or about um, exchanging money for sex, it can uh, bring up topics that maybe we could be worried about abuse. We could be um, concerned about safeguarding risks and really any organisation that's using these tools needs to be prepared for that and needs to have appropriately trained staff and appropriate procedures and processes in place to manage that should that come up. Um, and again, just a, a little kind of to emphasise about data storage um, and being in a private space. So, for example, an organisation could say, you know, that they've met someone that think is high risk. They're having condom the sex of multiple partners. That person didn't realise that that put them at high risk of HIV and they feel ready to make a change. So perhaps they get in touch with the local sexual health services. They get started on PrEP and um, condoms. They get vaccination against Hep B and they're getting regular testing for BVB and that's obviously a really good outcome for the health and well-being of that person and also from a public health perspective. So really, you know, this can evidence the impact of that organisation having that discussion and performing that intervention with their service users. So here's just some resources um, that can be helpful. So I just put the um, Local sexual health services for Birmingham and Solihull or Umbrella Health and people can self refer there. So it's no formal process. So I've just put the link there and then some more information about the hepatitis B vaccine from the British Liver Trust, what we mean by Fast Track Cities Plus and then the People First Charter. So that's about um, language to be used when you're discussing people living with HIV. And other really helpful places would be Birmingham LGBT or Terence Higgins Trust if you wanted to refer people to online resources. OK, so I can stop sharing my slides now. That's the end of my presentation. I don't know if anyone had any comments.